I recently bought myself a new multimeter, as an early Christmas gift. But this is no ordinary multimeter, it is an energy multimeter. Which means by connecting its three probes to a suitable main socket adapter, we can measure the electric power and also energy over time of all hooked up AC appliances. And while measuring the power draw of a few circuits, I noticed that most of them feature a rather low power factor and thus draw comparatively much reactive power, which is not desirable. But what actually is the power factor or reactive power to begin with? Well, stay tuned, because in this Electronic Basics episode, I will tell you all about this negative side effect of power electronics and what consequences it can have for our power grids. Let's get started. Let's start with a classical example for reactive power. The transformer. When I hooked up my first transformer to the power grid, I was shocked to find out that it drew quite a lot of current on the inputs without even featuring a power drawing load on the outputs. This example features a voltage of 228 volts and a current of 24 milliamps on the inputs, which would equal a power of around 5.5 watts. That would get turned into heat. That would be quite inefficient. But while I was touching the transformer, I realized that it was not getting as hot as the power draw would let you suspect. The reason is that I measured the apparent power, whose unit is volt ampere, which is quite literally how you calculate it as well. This apparent power consists of true power, which for example heats up a resistor or moves an electric motor, and reactive power, which is almost not useful for anything. To better understand it, let's have a look at the mains voltage and more importantly the current the transformer draws. Now please ignore the weird V-shape the transformer creates, whose reason are the magnetic properties of it. And instead let's focus on the phase shift between voltage and current. As you can see, the current is lagging, with a phase shift of around 80 degrees. The reason is that the transformer builds up a complex impedance consisting of a resistor and inductor. But feel free to watch my previous basics video about the subject to learn more about that. To make this example simpler though, let's decrease the resistance of the impedance to almost zero and thus replace the transformer with an inductor. By hooking it up to a suitable sinusoidal AC voltage and connecting the measurement equipment, we can see how its current is a decent looking sine wave with a phase shift of 90 degrees. Now I already told you that apparent power is calculated by voltage multiplied by current, which I can do on the oscilloscope through the math function. As you can see, the resulting power waveform changes its polarity with double the frequency and the areas underneath the waveform to zero are about the same size. That means in the positive areas the inductor acts as a load by consuming power and in the negative areas the inductor acts as a generator by supplying power. And since the areas are about the same, the average power draw of the inductor is basically zero, so no true power is being used. All the inductor does is oscillating power between itself and the power source through its electromagnetic fields. And this power is known as reactive power, with the unit volt ampere reactive. At this point you might be asking yourself, if this power simply creates an oscillation and does not really waste power, why should I care about it? Well, the reason is that current does flow nevertheless, which means our wires not only need to be able to handle the true current, but also the reactive current, which means they need to be thicker. And since a wire also features a small resistance, as well as a few other components, even reactive current does create a small power loss. By the way, if we would look at the power curve of a traditional resistor, we would see that the power would only be positive due to the same polarity of the current and voltage, which means the resistor always acts as a load. 
But anyway, now we know that our transformer draws reactive power due to its inductance. How can we fix it? Since the transformer is a rather complex electrical component, all we have to do is to attach a load to its secondary side. And it acts more like a resistive load, that only draws a very small amount of reactive power. So that is a bad example. Let's rather focus on the small synchronous motor I got from a microwave. By directly connecting it to mains voltage, we can not only see that the small motor shaft slowly rotates, but also that it draws around 4.2 volts ampere, 3 volts ampere reactive, and 2.9 watts. Now its current draw is rather small, but on the oscilloscope we can still see the inductive phase shift of the current, for which motors are pretty notorious, since they mainly consist of inductors. So the question is, how can we decrease the reactive power of the motor? And the solution is a capacitor. By connecting it solely to a sinusoidal AC voltage, it also creates a phase shift, but this time the current is leading with an angle of 90 degrees. That means the calculated power waveform also alternates between a load and generator function, and therefore power also theoretically only oscillates from and to the capacitor due to its electrostatic fields, which means no true power. And since we know from the previous basics episode that inductors and capacitors basically oppose each other, we would only have to draw the same reactive power with the capacitor as the inductor to get rid of it all. So I did a small calculation to find out that I would need a 0.18 microfarad capacitor to cancel out the inductive reactive power. The closest one I got though were two 0.068 microfarad capacitors in parallel, which I hooked up to the motor in order to find out that we successfully decreased the reactive power to one third of the original value. Of course, such compensation makes much more sense for bigger motors, or in the industry where you got loads of inductive loads, but then you would be utilizing more automated compensation circuits. But let's summarize. In a complex plane, we would have our true power P in watts alongside the real axis. The reactive power Q in volts ampere reactive then goes upwards for inductive loads and downwards for capacitive loads, which is also the way they can compensate one another. The apparent power S in volts ampere is then the resulting vector which also explains why the apparent power is not the sum of the true and reactive power, but instead features the Pythagoras theorem. So what is left is the power factor, which is mentioned on my energy meter. Now the power factor describes the relation between true power and apparent power. But wait a minute, doesn't that mean that the cosine phi of our power triangle is also the power factor? Well, for reactive power, which only consists of phase shifts due to inductors and capacitors, that is correct. That is also why AC motors usually come with a cosine phi rating rather than a power factor rating. The reason why the power factor does exist anyway is that there can be cases where the reactive power is split in its traditional reactive power as well as the deformed power D. An example for that would be my laptop power supply, which after hooking it up and connecting it to my laptop draws a decent amount of reactive power, even though its current waveform does not feature a phase shift. The problem this time is that the current is no longer sinusoidal, which is a problem that many modern switch mode power supplies come with since they only need to charge up their energy saving capacitor near the peak of the mains AC voltage. To understand this problem better though, we need to be familiar with the Fourier series, which mathematically looks like this. As an example, let's use this periodic square wave with a frequency of 2 pi. Now the function of this Fourier series is to dissect the regarded periodic function into additions of sinusoidal functions, while starting with the fundamental frequency and then going up to the second, third, fourth and so on harmonic. 
This way, by overlaying those individual functions, we slowly recreate the original square wave, which basically means every function consists of an infinite number of sinusoidal functions. Now since I'm not in the mood of mathematically analyzing our current waveform, I simply utilized the current harmonics function of my oscilloscope to find out that we got lots of harmonics with odd numbers. That means we got many waveforms floating around with a higher frequency, which just like an inductor and capacitor, would only let power oscillate between the loads and power grids. To get rid of this problem, we can use a technique called PFC, or power factor correction. But that is a subject for another video, since at this point you should be familiar with the basics of true, reactive, apparent and deformed power and understand why those can be negative for our power grids. If you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Stay creative and I will see you next time.